Okay, just to remind ourselves of the last module, we saw that in a two-slit diffraction experiment, the first interference maximum occurs at an angle given by the inverse sine of the ratio of Planck's constant to the product of the slit spacing times the momentum of an electron. And we saw that the minimum momentum for a photon to be able to resolve where an electron uh, had gone was on the order of Planck's constant divided by the spacing of the slits. Remembering that momentum is a vector quantity, if the electron were to start off in this direction and have a momentum equal to the photon's momentum imparted to it, then its change in direction would be given approximately by the ratio of h over d to p e inverse sine of, but that is just the angle of the first diffraction uh, maximum. So this reminds us then that the um, that the uh, attempt to measure the position of the electron spoils the interference effects that are called the hallmarks of quantum mechanics. Another statement of this is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and it states that in any measurement in which one tries to measure an electron to within some distance delta x, the corresponding uncertainty in the momentum of the electron, delta p, is given by the product of the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in momentum, being approximately Planck's constant. For a macroscopic object where x is meters and p is uh, kilogram meters per second, um, the uncertainty in any one of these two things is infinitesimal. On the atomic scale, it's very significant. Planck's constant 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 momentum times um, position means kilogram meters per second times meters or meter squared per kilogram uh, per second, meter squared kilograms per second rather, um, can be rewritten knowing that energy, which is a half mass uh, times velocity squared, for kinetic energy, so we can write that as kg meters squared over seconds squared. If we then multiply this by seconds, we'll see that that is equivalent to kg meters squared over seconds, the units of Planck's constant. So we can then use as units uh, for Planck's constant Joule seconds, energy times seconds. This leads to a second form of the uncertainty principle, which states that the uncertainty in the measurement of an energy multiplied by the time over which that measurement is made is on the order of Planck's constant. So these are two forms of Planck's constant, and using them one can do a remarkably, a remarkably good job of uh, estimating the properties of atomic systems. Let's begin with the hydrogen atom, and we're going to portray the hydrogen atom as a box uh, or a cylindrical hole of radius r, where, remember we said before, r was half an angstrom, Let's ask then what the kinetic energy uh, is of an electron confined to such a box purely from the uncertainty principle. So to do this, we are going to estimate the momentum this way. and then putting in the value for Planck's constant 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 
joule seconds gives us a value for the momentum of approximately 1 times 10 to the minus 24 kilogram meters per second. The kinetic energy, which classically is given by a half mass times velocity squared, which is the same as p squared over 2m, one can calculate, given that the mass of an electron is uh, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. You'll find all these numbers in Appendix uh, A of the book. And plugging this in one then gets a value for the kinetic energy of around about 6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Remembering that um, for a body in circular orbits, not really a true picture, but we'll use it anyway, um, kinetic energy is approximately equal to potential energy. The total energy of the ground state then will be twice this, or about 12 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That actually is a surprisingly a good estimate of the ground state energy of a hydrogen atom. So given the radius, we've estimated the ground state energy of the hydrogen atom using the uncertainty principle. Let's turn now to a problem in spectroscopy. Consider an atom with two energy states separated by some amount delta E. If we shine light on uh, these, this atom, we can cause the electron to move to the upper state, resulting in absorption of the light. And if we plot the intensity of the absorption versus frequency, we'll see a peak like this. And for an atom not interacting with any uh, other atoms, the peak, of course, is at a frequency such that Planck's constant times the frequency is equal to delta E. But the line has an intrinsic width. And the question is, what is this width? Well, the width will be 1 over the time for an absorption. So we see here we have an energy and a time. Let's use delta E, delta T is h bar, to estimate the time for this transition. For an optical transition, uh, Delta E um, is on the order of about 3 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And so that will give us delta T is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds over 3 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, or delta T is about 10 to the minus 15, 2 times 10 to the minus 15 seconds, or 2 femtoseconds. That indeed is about the uh, correct time scale for atomic transitions, and the uh, corresponding frequency broadening then is on the order of 10 to the 15 hertz. So we've seen how to make uh, qualitative and actually reasonably quantitative estimates of atomic properties using nothing more than the uncertainty principle. Our next task is to turn to the tools for making exact calculations. These are the Schrodinger equation and wave functions.